Eco Explorers. I'm Anna, an educator at the North Carolina Arboretum. For the entire month of May, we're looking at plant relationships with themselves, with animals, with people, and with you. For this week, we've turned this episode into a game show called The Plant and Animal Connection! as we know it is built around these connections. Plants rely on animals for so many things, and likewise, animals need plants to achieve their basic needs for survival. And sometimes, not any old plant or animal will do. Some of these plant and animal relationships have evolved between specific species over millions of years. They are specialized for each other. Today for our game show, you will get to help connect some plants and animals that need each other. Now, let's look at an example of animals relying on plants. This example relates to their habitat, a place where an organism lives. Now let's welcome our first contestant, the gray squirrel. Welcome, welcome. All right, eco explorers, time to pick the plant with the best connection to the gray squirrel. Your options are a maple tree, an oak tree, or a holly tree. Pick the best one. If you said oak tree, you are correct! Squirrels tend to live in forests where there are oak trees because they love their seeds, acorns. Squirrels in their habitat will collect leaves and twigs and bark and moss and weave them together to make their nests, also called drays. Excellent work, team! Our last contestant relied pretty heavily on a plant for its survival, which was pretty nutty. Our next contestant is a plant that relies pretty heavily on animals. Please welcome Burdock! Welcome, how's it going? All right, burdock here is a plant that has spiky round fruit for its seeds known as burrs. And burrs with burdock are looking for an animal to help hitch a ride somewhere else so they can grow in a new spot. All right, Eco Explorers, your options for the best plant animal connection for burdock are a salamander, an animal with smooth skin, a robin, an animal with feathers, or a fox, an animal with fur. Which do you think would have the best transportation method for burdock? If you said fox, you are correct. Have you ever been walking through the woods with your dog and after it you're picking out these burrs from its fur? Well, that's exactly how burdock travels and grows in new places, by hitching a ride with animal fur. Now, not all seeds travel by sticking to an animal. Some must be eaten first. Some plants like holly, dogwood, and service berry encase their seeds in a delicious fruit that some animals just can't get enough of. Cedar waxwings, blue jays, and black bears are some of these critters that seek out these tasty fruits. And what goes in must come out. The fruits get digested, but the seeds pass through and end up in scat, which ends up in the ground for seeds to germinate and turn into new plants. The animals get to eat, the seeds get to be dispersed. Win-win! When two organisms of different species both benefit, we call that mutualism. Let's now take a look at another form of mutualism, pollination by animals. Pollination is the transfer of pollen from one part of a flower to another. So without further ado, let's welcome our third contestant, the ruby-threaded hummingbird. Welcome. All right, friends, which is the best plant connection for our hummingbird? A dandelion? columbine, or a daisy. Here's a hint. Think about the hummingbird's beak shape and which flower it would best fit with. Fugus columbine, you're correct. I actually have a columbine here in person, I, I mean a plant. Let's go check it out. Hummingbirds have beaks that are specifically designed to get nectar out of these tubular flowers. Other flowers hummingbirds love include daylilies, cardinal flowers, and bee balms. As hummingbirds drink this nectar, pollen gets on their little tiny faces and their beaks, so when they go to the next flower of the same species, pollination occurs. Thanks for participating in our game show and helping connect plants and animals in need of each other. Now we're gonna jump over to Libby, one of our eco-correspondents, who's gonna expand on pollination by talking about pollinating insects. Thanks, Anna. This is Libby, and I am here at one of my favorite hiking trails near my home. Today, we are going to be discovering plant 
and animal relationships on the Appalachian Trail. So come on, let's go. Here I have found one of my favorite wildflowers. This is a great white trillium. Trilliums come in a lot of different varieties and they bloom as early as March all the way until June. Uh, you can find trilliums here in the mountains of Western North Carolina. You can also find them into the Piedmont of North Carolina. So these flowers, they depend on pollinators to help move their pollen. So these trillium love to stay in the understory or the shady part of the forest. And because they're so low to the ground and because they have all these big trees blocking them, they cannot rely on wind like other flowers can to move their pollen. So they rely 100% on different pollinating insects. So can you think of an example of a pollinating insect? I know. Some examples of pollinating insects can be butterflies, moths, bees, or even beetles. One hungry pollinator insect will get into this flower. It'll get the pollen all over their body and they help move the pollen either on this, to different parts on the same flower or to a different flower. Once the flower is pollinated, the plant can create a fruit and in that fruit is the seed. And once that seed is dispersed to a different area of the forest, we can have brand new beautiful trillium flowers. That was fun to see the swallowtail on the trillium. Thanks, Libby. Now we're gonna join another one of our eco-correspondents, Jenna, on her hike to see what she finds. Oh, hey, eco-explorers. I didn't see you there. My name is Jenna, and I'm on a hike. I'm in search of any evidence I can find of a plant and animal interaction. You wanna come help me? Okay, let's go. makes the tree build its home for it. Here, let me show you. This is called an oak apple gall. It's made by an oak tree, but it's caused by a little stingless wasp called a siphonipid that's a little bit bigger than a mosquito. The female wasp lays eggs in the stems of the oak tree in the fall, and when the larvae hatch in the spring, they begin to feed while injecting a chemical into the plant that causes this gall to grow. It grows around the wasp to protect it, and inside you'll see there's a lot of nutritious plant matter for the wasp larva to feed on while it's growing. And when it's ready to emerge as an adult, it will make a little hole and fly out. Well, thanks for coming along with us on our hike. Next time you're outside, try to notice the little clues that animals can leave behind on plants. Back to you, Anna. Wow, Jenna, what a cool plants and animal interaction. Thanks. Now, before we sign off, I wanna go over this week's challenge. Your mission is to take three photos of plants and submit them to your Eco Explorer account. One of these photos must be evidence of a plant and animal interaction. This could include an animal on the plant, an animal's home on the plant, or evidence that an animal was eating the plant, like holes or bite marks on a leaf. Add a description in the comment section as to what type of interaction is going on. Complete three out of the six challenges on our website to earn your botany badge. Don't forget to check your email every Monday for a fun new newsletter with lots of cool activities. Also, tune into Eco Explorer's Facebook Live every weekday at 2 p.m. to see some exploring in action and maybe get a little inspired. Good luck, have fun, keep exploring. <laughs>